Okay, so I briefly want to talk about, I guess this is chapter one in the textbook. I know it's out of order, but it's all right. It'll work out. Uh, I just want to share a few little things that I got from the textbook, and hopefully you'll get from the textbook as well. In its broadest definition, communication comes from the Greek communicare, which means to make common. So communication means to make common. That's it. And it seems that it'd be fairly easy, but it's also extraordinarily difficult to make that make sense to everybody. Let's think about how we communicate. Uh, matter of fact, let's take this video, for instance. In this video, we have Dell, and I am the sender of this message, and you are the receiver. And the message is, um, communication exists, and communication is a thing, and communication is what we're studying. That's the message. I'm using the video as a channel to send that message. Communication happens, but there's much more to it than that, and we're going to dig into some real stuff here. The linear view for communication is just sender, message, receiver, channel. But that's not the way that we actually communicate. If we think about social media, which everybody has already done, I saw the discussion boards. There's a sender, a message, a receiver, a channel, noise, and feedback. When I post on Instagram, even me, I'm looking for some sort of positive feedback. Did you like what I posted? Did you not like what I posted? Uh, this is what I cooked last night. I'm not a fantastic, most fantastic person in the world. And when I get that positive feedback, it makes me feel better. When I get the negative feedback, it makes me feel worse. And then we start the communication transaction all over again. So transactional communication includes a message and a feedback message. Whoa, stop. We're going to start all over again because there are several different levels to communication. Intrapersonal communication has one communication sender receiver. I communicate with me. I have been known in some of my former lives to use foul language periodically. But when I'm recording and I'm posting this on YouTube, I want to make sure I don't curse. So I have to think about what I'm saying. And this is when this intrapersonal communication takes place. I plan out what I'm going to say on my lecture. I practice it and then I stand before you and have all these fantastic hand movements to make me sound more exciting than I really am. <coughs> That's part of intrapersonal communication. When I decide which words to use, it gets better. I'm not bilingual, but my daughter is partially bilingual. She has one degree in French. So she speaks French. She speaks an Americanized version of French. But as she's speaking and as she's interpreting, she has to translate through her, her own head what this means in English and what this means in French. And that's the intrapersonal communication. That translation is intrapersonal. Now, if we add another person to this party here, we slip into dyadic communication. So now we have a dyad, two individuals. I have a grand puppy. Her name is Penelope. I will show you a picture, but it's not that important. When I tell Penelope here, it's as if she speaks and understands English. She runs here. And Penelope is a bulldog, so she jumps on me. And that's just what she does. That's the communication. I communicate to Penelope here. She responds, feedback message, by running here and jumping. That's the transaction punctuated. Intrapersonal communication is easier than dyadic communication. 
because something can go wrong between my saying here and Penelope running here. And it's much less likely to go wrong if it's just me, me telling me to say Penelope here. Now here's where it gets tricky. Dyadic communication is a bit easier than small group communication. Okay, I know what you're thinking. When you're thinking, but this class is called interpersonal communication. What is this dyadic communication and small group communication? And large group communication. And public communication. What is all of this stuff? Where is the interpersonal? The beauty of it is large group communication, small group communication, and dyadic communication are all part of interpersonal communication. Small group communication is more difficult than dyadic communication because you have more than one contact point. That's a dyad, but when you add a third person, you've got a triad, and you've got three communication connections with those three individuals. When I say Penelope, here, she comes here. But if I say Penelope here, and Casey, my son-in-law, is standing next to me, Penelope will run to Casey and not to me, because it's Penelope, me, and Casey. And we are all part of this communication transaction. And we have to change it. So if I say Penelope here and step to the side, Penelope thinks, OK, wait a minute, do I go to Casey or do I go to Dell? And then she makes a decision and she does what she's going to do. So if I say Casey here, Penelope will look up and think, I heard the word here. Is that for me? And, and who is Casey? Because I don't think she actually calls him Casey, just I do. But that's small group communication. You add another party to this, and you've added six communication connections for four people. You add another party to this, and you can see how small group communication can get out of control. Because you've got to pay attention to every single one of those communication connections in a small group, as long as you are still in the same space, um, consuming the same message. Small group communication for the purposes of our class and our class only in the 29. We think on average a person can manage 29 different individuals within all those communication connections. I don't know the math. I think it's something like 600 communication connections with 29 people. Beyond that, it gets much less manageable. So what we do is we'll do 30 plus to create large group communication. And the pattern is, for humans with large group communication, is to communicate differently to a larger group than with a smaller group. With a smaller group, you have to pay attention to all those communication connections. With a larger group, it's not possible. There are just too many of them for you to to um, fathom while you're doing your intrapersonal communication to pick the right messages for the whole group. So we group people together. We take this large group and we segment it. We may segment it by space, or we may segment it by race, we may segment it by gender. We can segment it any way we want to, but we do segment it be because that helps us to make it much more manageable. Now, we use the same confined space. Small group communication, large group com communication, Dyadic communication is all within a confined space. Let's use that same confined space and we'll do 100 plus. The beauty of communication with 100 plus is we eliminate all those communication connections. And we assume that the sender receiver is communicating only with the audience. Now you will slip into some large group communication with that audience. You'll slip into some small group communication with the audience. You'll slip into some dyadic communication with the audience. You'll stay on the intrapersonal. But generally, within public communication, 100 or more people within a confined space, it's speaker audience. And that's just the way it works. And that means public communication is as easy as dyadic communication in some ways, and a little more difficult in other ways. Other levels of communication. And these two are completely separate from the other intra interpersonal communications. One of those is organizational.
Organizational communication is different in that with organizational communication, it's not really a matter of an audience or communication connections. The commonality is the communication message. I work at Prince George's Community College. My president is Dr. Charlene Dukes. Dr. Charlene Dukes has an idea. She says that we're going to create an institution where education is less expensive. So we're gonna use open education resources. And she's thinking this to herself after reading a couple of articles. So what she does is she says, yep, this is a good idea. I'm gonna go with it. But first I'm gonna call my provost, my vice president of academics, uh, Clay. Clay, Dr. Clay Rayleigh, Clayton Rayleigh. So she calls Clay Rayleigh and she says, hey, Clay, got this idea. How about we start using OERs, Open Educational Resources? Clay says, Ugh, I don't know. I mean, there's some good parts to it, some bad parts to it. What are the benefits to us? What are the benefits to the students? And then they have this discussion and they agree, yes, OERs is what we're gonna do. So Clay says, this is a good idea, Dr. Dukes, let's make it happen. So what Clay does is he brings together his whole team of academics, all the deans, and my dean is um, Nicole, I'll tell you later. <coughs> so Clay calls all the deans, and he calls uh, Dean Nicole, and says, uh, Nicole and all the other deans, this is what we're gonna do. And the deans say, that's a great idea of Dr. Rady. Let's get on that. So what they do is they each have meetings with their teams, and they call all of their department chairs. My department chair is Ennis Allen. So Ennis Allen is my boss. Nicole is her boss. Clay is her boss, and Dukes is his boss. So all the way up the chain. But it starts with intrapersonal communication, dyadic communication, and then the small group communication within those teams. One common message, OERs is what we're gonna do, and then we have this large group communication as the dean or the department chair talks to the entire department or the entire division. Then we have this public communication when the president or the provost talks to the whole campus community and says, yes, this is what we're doing and this is how we're going to do it. So we've got that public communication all the way up the chain which creates the common message for organizational communication. Now, let's flip back to the video that we're recording here. With this video, we're recording something that could be considered mass media communication. With mass com communication or mass com, the difficulty is not the message, not the communication connections, everything, because this is linear. Once I post this on um, YouTube, yes, my students are invited to see it, but everybody could see it. So I don't know who is gonna see it, I don't know how many people will see it, and I don't know how they're gonna react. And the only feedback I get are from the people who decide to post something in the comments or email me directly. So then we have all of these different levels of communication with increasing levels of difficulty with the message. So this is the levels of communication. Now let's flip back to that message for a minute. So far, what do you think? Is it making sense? Is it bringing the book together? Because now things get really weird. Okay, so I'm still the sender, and you are still the receiver. However, you will give me feedback through the discussion board, you'll give me feedback through email, you may give me feedback directly on uh, YouTube. <coughs> which means you become a sender. And I become the receiver. We still have the message, the channel, the feedback channel, the feedback message. That transaction is punctuated once we go through the whole process. But it gets more complicated. Let's go into the message a bit deeper because the message has four or five parts. One of those parts is the encoded or intended message. So I've decided that I want you to know more about communication and messaging. 
So as I'm doing that, I create this whole video project and this whole thing on the whiteboard. My encoded message is, communication is hard, but your decoded or interpreted message may not be the same as my encoded message. Your decoded message might be, Dell is crazy, or Dell is smart. Let's go with Dell is smart. That's not the same as the encoded message, communication is hard. But what is the same is the content. The content doesn't change. This is the content. What does change, and is never the same, is the relational portion. If I did this entire lecture all over again, if you watched this video the second time, this would not be, have the same impact the second time around as it does this time. And what I'm suggesting is, if all four parts are the same, then and only then do we have an ideal message. That is perfect clarity. Where what I intend to say is what you interpret. And the content is not changeable, but our relationship has no impact, or the number of times we've communicated has no impact on the message itself. If that happens, you get a clear or ideal message. I'm saying that very rarely happens. <coughs> okay, here's an assignment we're gonna do on the discussion board. I'm gonna share with you three verbal messages. All I want you to do is type out in the discussion board exactly how you interpret each of these messages. The first one is, teaching is the epitome of learning. I'll repeat it. Teaching is the epitome of learning. Don't look any words up, just type out what it means right in the discussion board, and then go back and look what other people have posted on that, and see how close you are to exactly the words, the exact phrases that other people have used. Don't cheat. Statement number two. Thick chicks is Gucci, Mo. I'll repeat. Thick chicks is Gucci, Mo. Once again, type out exactly what it means, how you decode my message, and don't cheat, and then go back in and look at what other people are saying, and maybe you can identify that you agree with somebody exactly. <coughs> and my last one, catchy full igwe. I'll repeat, catchy full igwe. Once again, don't look up the words, don't Google translate it. Uh, figure out what it means to you. Type it in to the discussion board and see what other people are saying on each of those three messages. So you'll have three posts within the discussion board for this exercise. And we're gonna look at just the messages there. Oh my goodness. Communication is hard, but it gets harder. We're gonna talk about three different types of noise. One of those types of noise is environmental noise. You probably can't hear it because the microphone's not all that great on this uh, GoPro, but we have an AC unit in this room that's blowing cooler air. Not cold, but cooler. That creates environmental noise that may have an impact on how you interpret the message or how I interpret your feedback message, if it's just verbal. Another type of noise is physiological noise. So if my ears don't work quite well because I have a head cold, or um, my tongue is swollen so the words don't come out the way that I want them to come out, that's physiological noise. That also impacts the clarity of the message. <coughs> a third type is the psychological noise. We talked in another recording about my accent. I have a thick Midwestern accent. So with my accent, if you pay more attention to the accent than you do to the words that I'm saying, then that creates psychological noise. Your thinking process changes the way you interpret the message, and that may have an impact on the clarity of that message. Okay, so that's all done. The fourth type of noise does not impact the message at all. It impacts the channel, and that's contextual noise. Okay, you're not this person, but there is probably somebody in our class that is not very technologically savvy, so they have not seen this video, even though I posted the video, even though you've seen the video, they have a completely different interpretation of it because they cannot access the channel, so they never even get to the message. Those are the four types of noise that impact the message. 
In the next lecture, I'm going to talk about the individual cultural identity. And the ICI, or individual cultural identity, is everything that makes me who I am and teaches me how to communicate. It is also everything that makes you who you are and teaches you how to communicate. And we'll come back to another discussion board that we'll use for ICI. That's all I got for right now. Let me know what you think. I'll talk to you again soon.